So kia ora koutou katoa, no mai haere mai. Thank you very much for joining us on an evening with Costa Botes. Um, uh, if you can just turn your video off during the presentation and then please feel free to turn it on again for the Q&A. Um, that will just enable us to focus on these incredible visuals for which Costa is world famous. Um, just a little note of apology. Costa's battling ill health, um, particularly tonight, might have a bug. So please just bear with. Um, thank you, Costa, for soldiering on. You really are a trooper. So, um, by way of introduction, Costa is an award-winning independent New Zealand filmmaker who writes, directs, produces and edits across short, feature and documentary formats. Costa's international acclaim includes the jury prize at the Clermont Ferrand Short Film Festival for Stalin's Sickle and the Critics Prize at the Venice Film Festival for Forgotten Silver, a mockumentary he co-wrote and co-directed with Peter Jackson in 1995, which has become a cult favourite worldwide. People are always talking about Forgotten Silver. Mm. After established his own production company, Lone Pine Film and TV Productions, in 2005 to make independent documentaries, and his films have gained selection at Slamdance, Hot Dogs, IDFA, Toronto, and many more. Um, so recently, Costa has focused, focused more on documentaries with works including Act of Kindness, the story of a young New Zealander's experiences in post-genocide genocide Rwanda, Team Tibet, which tells the story of Aotearoa's first Tibetan refugee, Angie, which explores the story of Angie Mikuljohn, who spent time in Centrepoint, where she suffered sexual abuse, and most recently, and described by critics as possibly his greatest work yet, when the Cows Come Home, which <laughs> premiered at the 2022 New Zealand International Film Festival and documents the relationship between a reclusive farmer and his cows. Now, it would be remiss of me if I didn't also mention that um, Costa is also particularly renowned for his generous mentorship of emerging talent. And just one example of this is Zoe McIntosh, with whom Costa has worked on multiple films, won a 2010 Qantas Film and Television Award for Best Documentary for Lost in Wonderland about lawyer Rob Moody. Another of their collaborations is The World in Your Window, which won 10 international awards, including Best International Short Film at Melbourne, at Flickrfest, at Short Shorts Asia, at Tahiti Film Festival and Vancouver Women in Film International Film Festival, and was also a 2019 Academy Awards contender. So without further ado, over to you, Costa, and I shall dutifully turn myself off until question time. Thank okay. You. All right. Well, um, just let me know if uh, you can't hear what I'm saying. Uh, I'll attempt to stay conscious throughout this little talk. Uh, you might be wondering what you're looking at here. It's, um, it's the west coast of Turkey, and it's actually the cliffs above Gallipoli. And the island that you see in the in the, the far distance there is an island called Embros, and that's where I was born. And uh, so, I think that's that's a really important part of my story. I have always felt like not a refugee except, uh, exactly, but I've always felt like someone out of out of place, out of time, and never really been particularly comfortable in my skin. And I think this is a uh, an experience that's quite common for young people when when their parents uh, do do quite a drastic move from you know where, where they are to <laughs> to go somewhere else. And I think this is going to be something that happens more and more. Um, here's another photo, and you can see it's like Brigadoon. It's like um, little tumble down stone village everything falling apart everything um and actually it's in better condition now than than it was because some people have gone back and they've they've repaired it but the life that my family had here is a, is pretty much over this is uh, my family's home would you want to live there <laughs> it's um it's not the most salubrious is it uh, and this is a photo of me, a cute little cherub with my mother, and I think I must have been about three years old there, 
and that was the age I was when um, I just clicked that admit that was the age I was when uh, my family moved to New Zealand so I was very very young and very very confused and when we fetched up in Wellington I, I, I have uh, you know scattershot memories nothing particularly coherent but this is a memory that I have quite a strong memory of um, of the trams and, and the colors and uh, I think that photo actually it's almost like it brought my memory to life right here and something else that happened really early in my in my life was my parents used to go to the movies and they were living in Kilburnie and I've actually mislabeled it the kinema is actually in Kilburnie not Newtown um, and my parents would go once a week it didn't matter what was on they just just went and I'd go with them and I got to see some stuff that probably wasn't uh, all that suitable for a five-year-old um, spy tales and such but I got to see one film which truly blew my mind this one and it's a film about uh, you know, it's literally a fantastic voyage. Uh, a group of scientists are shrunk down to tiny micro -si mi microbe size so that they can enter the body of um, a, a sick scientist and heal them from, from the inside, which is quite a, quite a whopping concept. And um, I mean, it looks ridiculous now with the special effects that, that were available at the time. But for me, it was just um, just a door opening into something utterly fantastic and I was hooked I was truly hooked and then I started to go to the movies any um, chance I got we moved to Newtown and the nearest cinema was the Ascot which you can see here uh, corner of Riddiford Street and it was a bit of a flea pit by then it had no carpet and all the kids used to roll the jaffers noisily down the aisles <laughs> and but I, I got to enjoy an experience that I think I think is no longer available for for kids today they I mean we we, we would see um, a whole bunch of trailers we would see a whole bunch of uh, short films um, and uh, yeah that you never knew what, what was going to be on. It was like just, just a lucky dip every week. You just went. It was a habit. Can't imagine that today. Nowadays, for anyone to go to a movie, they, <laughs> they, they want to know everything about it before they go and see it. And so it goes. So let's flip forward a little bit further. I started taking photos. I, uh, I had a... Uh, not a very not a good little camera, just a little Kodak snappy thing. And I started taking photos and then I got a better camera and I taught myself um, stuff about um, exposure. And I taught myself how to uh, process negative and print it. And I became quite good at that stuff. I, it was a real um, um, like apprenticeship, I suppose, a self-apprenticeship. <laughs> no one was teaching me, I was just teaching myself. And I was doing that at Wrong Tai College, which otherwise was a school that I loathed and detested. And um, I still suffer um, some feelings of trauma from my time there. Uh, I wasn't a happy camper there. I just don't feel it was a school that really um, um, did much for people like me who wanted to do creative things. So I will forever bear a grudge against Wrong Tai College. But, you know, you meet people who um, become important to, to your life. And uh, I met a fellow, um, his name was Brent Crockett. He was uh, my age, and his father was a cameraman. This guy here. And his name, believe it or not, was Davy Crockett. Yes, really. And Davy Crockett, um, he had all kinds of equipment that he would let Brent and me use. We would go out with a little Bolex camera. He'd, he'd lend us some short ends of film 
and then he'd put it in with some of his stuff to to print it and so you know we we were learning to be filmmakers not not so much under dave's watchful eye because i don't think he was particularly interested but he did give us the means to uh play around and and do stuff and we did we did stuff um dave crockett ended up becoming notorious when he was on a, a plane an argosy plane that flew across um cook strait and they saw uh ufo activity <laughs> this is a, a terrible picture but um it always makes me laugh because it caused such a ruckus and people were just fascinated but um, when you actually look at the shots that that dave crockett got they look like this <laughs> it's not very impressive is it um a lesson to us all to um get our shots and focus i think so um life went on and i decided that i wanted to get some kind of um training or some kind of qualification and there was well there was nowhere to go as far as i could see but then a friend of mine was in um, Canterbury, at Canterbury University, and he uh, rang me up and he said, you know what, uh, the School of Fine Arts has a, a program in film, why don't you look into that? And so I did, and a year later I packed all my belongings and I went down there, and for the next three years I, I don't know what I did, I, <laughs> I mucked around. <laughs> But, but um, it was great. I, I mucked around in productive ways. I, I made things. And um, again, a lot of self-learning. There, there wasn't much um, in the way of um, technical instruction. It was just, here's the tools and go for it. And then I came out of uh, university. I got my Diploma of Fine Arts, otherwise known as a DIP FA. <laughs> yeah. And um, and then I thought, oh, what am I going to do now? And what I did was I managed to get a job on this silly thing here. I was a, a third assistant director on a professional film. And my job was um, looking after the, the elves and the penguins who were inside a terribly, terribly hot studio and basically expiring daily <laughs> from, from heat exhaustion. And my job was to go around and just feed them cold water, keep them alive. But I learned a fair bit about you know, the organization on set and the kind of processes that, that go on and the kind of process, processes that maybe shouldn't go on because I wasn't that impressed with the director. And I thought, well, there must be a better way. And eventually over time, I think I learned it. So. I, I felt a wee bit discouraged. I didn't really think there was going to be much um, opportunity for me to, to make a, a living at this. So I, I just got the first job that came along. And I got a job here at Van Steveren Brothers, who were import business. And for three years, I packed things and sent them around the country. It, it made me very humble. <laughs> But it gave me um, a small income and it meant that I could pursue my filmmaking in my own time, which I did. I made uh, three films during that three year process and I just kept going. I just put my head down. I didn't give up. I just kept going. And then I was offered a, a, a job on um, a TV series. Hello. This might ring a bell for some of you. It's, uh, it's Wurzel Gummidge. It's actually John Pertwee. Uh, who played a, a strange scarecrow. It's kids, a kid's show. The director of the show, well, he's not, um, he's not Stanley Kubrick, but he was very good. He was very efficient, and I learned a lot from watching him. And I also learned a lot from watching him direct children, because that was his great weakness. His, his approach to directing kids was, I thought, terrible. And I guess I, I, I sort of got the big head, and I thought, well, I can do better than that mainly because I didn't think I could do any worse. But in other ways, James Hill, that was his name. James was um, a very efficient director and very professional. And the other thing that happened on Wurzel Gummidge was um, I made a connection that's been really important in my life or was, um, I met Peter Jackson. 
and you can't see Peter Jackson here, but he's lurking around somewhere. <laughs> he was called in to do a special effect, and um, uh, someone had met him at a party, and, and they'd got to talking, and, and Peter had let it be known that he could do um, little explosions, and they needed a little explosion, so they got Peter in, and I got to meet him on set, and we became fast friends after that. Here's the explosion. Kaboom. Pretty good. And um, I had made a couple of, I'd made a, um, a half hour drama for television. And I, I don't particularly want to talk about that now, but um, it sort of consolidated me as, as a player. <laughs> and then there was an idea that I really liked. And I thought this would make a great film. And I got onto it. And I developed a script with Anne Kennedy, as a very fine writer, and um, eventually we, oh gosh, it was such an uphill battle, but we got there, we got the money to make it, and I'll just show you a little clip from that film. He didn't die. He didn't die at all. If people thought he was dead, he could do his evil work more easily. He caught an icebreaker to Alaska. He recruited Eskimos as communists. film did very well for me. Uh, it was screened on television. It won um, a, a good award um, at an international festival. And I guess people sort of sat up and thought, oh, this guy maybe can make films. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, <laughs> a year or two goes by with nothing. And this is the story of my life. And uh, I got onto a TV series that had come to Wellington and I was asked to direct a couple of episodes. It was um, it was a show based on stories by Ray Bradbury. And uh, I think I think that was a step up probably in professionalism for me because we had to work faster. We had to work harder. Um, and uh, the, the you know the, the standard needed to be higher. And um, Anyway, I'll show you a little clip from that.
are rats in the walls. It's me, Amy. Quite atmospheric, and um, she's a very, a very good young actor. Um, another thing I made during this period was, well, I didn't make it, I wrote it. <laughs> it sort of became um, um, a bit of a folly to, to try and, and, and make this, this short film. And George Port was the director, and George was very, very driven, and he got to um, he got to actually do it, and it's a film that um, was quite popular internationally. Um, it's about a war of noise between two neighbours, a situation that I'm sure everyone can relate to. Quite bonkers, eh? Very silly, but good fun. And George did a wonderful job of it. And and then um, uh, a big turning point for me. I had been just working quietly on by myself on a story idea that I wasn't sure how it was going to play out. But I just had a concept, and I kept plugging away and kept adding bits and pieces to it. And one day I took it to Peter Jackson and said, um, you know, do you want to have a look at this and just tell me what you think? And well, what he thought was he really liked it. And he suggested that we collaborate to make it together. And that became Forgotten Silver. So that's, this is probably the grave that they'll scratch on my gravestone, I think, for better or for worse. The team headed into the primordial west coast bush, deep into the last great unexplored region of forest in New Zealand. On February 22, 1919, filming commenced on the new version of Salome. Colin was ready for the great task that lay ahead. In his mind's eye, he saw his film as it would be, imagining every detail with a clarity of vision he had never experienced before. Maybell resumed her role of Salome, channeling her grief into a creative energy that delivered the performance of a lifetime. But after five days of frenzied shooting, the production stalled. Colin McKenzie had run out of money. And um, I think this, this film really <laughs> taught me the value of um, throwing difficulties in the path of a character, of constantly um, creating ups and lots of downs for a, a dramatic character. I think this is what people like when they watch a film. They don't want to see people just getting what they want easily. They want to see them struggle. They want to see them punished. They want to see them um, really go hard and um, and by the skin of their teeth succeed. That's interesting. And I think that's also interesting in documentaries as much as it is in, in drama. Uh, this is a topic that uh, occasionally gets me into trouble when I <laughs> discuss it with other people, but I'm not going to um, change my mind. I believe this to be true. Shame I didn't apply it uh, in this film here, Saving Grace, 
which put a, a, a just a disastrous stop on my career. It, it literally stopped me dead. Um, the film failed, and um, I'm responsible in large part for that. Not not entirely, but um, it was just a mistake, just a big big mistake. And um, boy, did I did I get punished for it. And uh, I think for a good ten years, I I couldn't. I couldn't go into the film commission. Uh, they they just didn't forgive me, and eventually, it it sort of passed into into history. Um, and I guess I'm a little bit resentful because, um, you know, we were learning. <laughs> we were all we were all trying our best, uh, and um, I won't say any more about that. What did I do? I needed a gig. I needed um, a job. Uh, I needed a paying job, and I just wanted to throw myself into some directing. And I, I was offered a, a job directing for television. This the show here, which was um, not the greatest show in the world, but what it did have was really, really good actors. The scripts were terrible, but the actors were wonderful. And um, most of the actors that you see here have gone on to. To do significant things in the New Zealand film industry since, and um, I really enjoyed working with them. And because I was working day in day out for months on end, um, I just got a lot better at, at what I did. I just, you know, there's nothing like practice. I keep saying this to students; they don't believe me. They seem to think that you're either born with um, oodles of talent or you're not. Well, that's just not true. Uh, you, you have the practice. You have to go out and skin your knees and fall over, make mistakes, and most of all, not give up. Just keep going. Uh, and then Peter Jackson, um, well, I, I don't know why he thought he could do this, but he hatched a plan to adapt one of the most unadaptable literary properties <laughs> in film history. Lord of the Rings, and of course the rest is history. He did a tremendous job, but I I rang him up and I said, Peter, um, have you got anyone who's going to you know document the making of the film? And he said, Why are you interested? I said, Yes, I am, and I'd become very interested in in documentary by the stage. I'd made one documentary, and but it wasn't really my my main focus. But I just thought. This, this would be something that that I could do and I would learn a lot. And boy, did it put me through the mill. Um, <laughs> it was, I like to say, the best of times and the worst of times. I think we're getting used to this location. It's not the easiest one to transport people in. It takes us like about 40 minutes to ship mm. in 30 people. And yes, this is a big day. 250, lots of it's with the army. Um, we've got a few independents and they've travelled from all over the place, like Napier and Palmerston North, and we've got a whole heap of Wellington elves who've come up to be elves here again. So we've got a, a good, strong bunch of regulars that keep coming back. It's a good location, it looks like the moon, but there's a lot of, um, you know, ankle twisting and uh, good knee snapping to be done as the, lo the actual set is so small and we're making people run. We've been using the army and we lost five orcs in the first day. Um, basically two to claustrophobia, one to a t two to twisted ankles and one to a busted Popped out knee. knee. Yeah. So. And in total it's seven down I think. Seven down. Seven to Rapehu, who nil to us. Yep. So. Going through them like flies. And the moss. I don't know if oh, you've the heard moss. about the moss. Doc's probably round mm. but Yes, we're only allowed to walk on the carpet, and you've probably seen a lot of carpet round. Mm. Oh, you're probably standing on moss. Actually, and ooh. So, it makes so things a little bit difficult. Sometimes we've seen people going to war, and then they're dodging moss instead of thinking about going to war. So, <laughs> just try and keep an eye on that. But we're very environmental, and everybody's very careful. Mm. Go, Go the dark. moss. Go the moss. Rocks. <laughs> rocks. Rocks. Yep, no rocks. <gasps> moss. <gasps> oh, shit. Moss, <laughs> avoiding the moss, going on to come, avoiding the moss, going on to the... <laughs> That's great. So, I, I don't know what the Hollywood studio thought when they watched 
that. I think they might have thought I'd lost my mind. And why was I concentrating on all this sort of vaguely humorous ephemera? I, I'm interested in that stuff. And the story they wanted to tell was one of a glorious journey uh, that looked essentially at the, um, the generals at the top of the tree. And they didn't, they just weren't interested in uh, the ordinary workers, the, the, the people at the bottom. I was. And uh, that, that, that created a lot of tension for me. Um, but in the end, I think, uh, I think I produced something good. And uh, it would be quite some years before before my documentaries about Lord of the Rings were, were released, but eventually they were, so that was nice. But I, I guess I have to say that I was really burned out and um, I came close to just quitting. I just came close to throwing in the towel and I thought, well, this is not a very rewarding life <laughs> that I'm having. Uh, and <clears throat> I picked... I picked a topic, I picked um, a subject that I thought I, I would like, and I just thought, I'm going to do this one for me. And it was about a group of musicians here in Wellington called the Windy City Strugglers, who I think really exemplify the idea of doing something for the love of it. And I made that film, and people really liked it. Ready? Keep them still. A struggler is a sociological term in America. And it means a person, it's a trailer park person, a person who's marginally economically viable. Oh, when you smile, oh, I want to be with you. Most, most bands, they sort of, you know, they start off and they're not very good and then they peak and they get good and then they sort of get sick of it and they break up and all that stuff. And the whole thing takes about three years. But the strugglers are still on the, on the upward part of the trajectory and it's taken 30. It's truly a Kiwi sound. It's about New Zealand, you know, the songs, you can smell the places that they sing about. Journeyman and craftsman, that's what you perceive straight away. You know, you go and see this band and you see a collection of individuals who are all very, very proficient at their instruments. They've all extremely weathered. They've been around for a long time and they still have that motivation and fearlessness that makes them a good band despite their age. In fact, it gets better with age, their type of music. I've done a, a lot of um, music related work um, with and for musicians. It's, it's not at all rewarding uh, from a financial point of view, but it's very, very satisfying creatively. Um, now, go forward another couple of years, and I met a fellow who told me that his father had invented the Jelly Belly Jelly Bean. And he and his partner invited me to Los Angeles and said, how would you like to come over and make a film about him? Dave Klein is his name. And so I did. I went over there for a month and I made a film called Candyman. The foreseen variety of color and taste made it the first choice candy for the disco generation. You said in five dollars, we would ship two pounds anywhere in the United States, postage included. We needed somebody to take care of the mail order division. That somebody was grandma, and she did it real good. My wife's mom. She did. She was a fantastic mail order person. She became me. She signed my name to it, told stories to the people about how the product was invented, all kinds of stuff. And as me, she did it as me. She needed to keep the beans on hand to fill the mail orders. 
She kept it in what was called the bean room. There was a dog there, Poopy. Poopy the dog, nice dog. He got into the bean room and he started to eat the beans over a period of time. And no, he was sneaky enough to not leave any trails. Nobody knew he was eating the beans. He died soon after that. He had diabetes. I think that I think the beans killed him. <laughs> That's his little story. Um, I like humor. I, I, I like these um, odd little sideways glances at, at human nature. Um, now I had a I had a clip. I think I think it might be a little heavy. I, I probably won't show that. So uh, let's move on. Um, one of the one of the actors who was in the tribe, Caleb Ross, I'd stayed in touch with, and one day I was on holiday in the far north, and he told me about the experiences he was having in northern Canada, and he showed me these photos of him interacting with polar bears and these Inuit sled dogs, and I got really interested, and eventually over after a couple of years, I was able to put together a, um, a production and go over there and, and, and make, make a film. So here's a, here's a little clip from that. I went up there to work with them for a month. And uh, a month turned into two. And I just stayed on. And it's been almost three years. Most people come up here to, to catch a glimpse of these bears and they probably, to be honest, a lot of them probably see the dogs and still don't really know uh, the history behind them or anything like that, which is a shame because if they, if they really knew what they were looking at, then uh, they'd realize they're looking at two very endangered species, not just one. Uh, everybody wants to save polar bears, but they could care less about the dogs that used to hunt them. These dogs are so close to extinction, it's stupid. If anything happens to this genetic pool here, I basically kiss another species goodbye. These dogs have learned how to handle the most harshest climate on the planet. They're here because they're supposed to be here. And we have tried so hard to preserve their character, preserve what they are. And how do you do that? Bring them inside and treat them like lap dogs? No, can't. They got to be the toughest buggers on the planet, man, in their environment. <laughs> Okay, um, I loved making that film. That was a great experience. And it really, um, I think from that film onwards, I started to feel like what I was doing was actually worth it. I, I dropped a lot of doubts about um, everything. I just thought, no, nah, um, I, think, I think what I do has some worth. And um, I just, just, again, just got on with it. And one of the things I got on with was a film that I inherited. Um, this chap had gone to Rwanda and had an interesting experience <laughs> and he had filmed himself but he was unable to uh, turn it into a film and so we uh, agreed to collaborate and my role was going to be to basically um, take his footage and actually put it into a, 
a coherent shape and, and, and tell his story. And this was quite a different kind of film for me. Uh, normally I just work alone, but there we go. trying to find a man who uh, helped me in 1999. I was taken hostage in Burundi and I came to Kigali with no money and a homeless man helped me. His name was Johnson. There are no road names on this map. It's fun filming out here. It's a bit of a drag. Every police officer or local authority policeman or security guard or private security guard, everyone is the boss. If anyone's seen Johnson, please give me a call. Big mistake. <laughs> Big mistake. So it's going to be difficult for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. And this was one of um, yeah, a string of films that I made really with the idea of showing at the New Zealand Film Festival because these are not commercial films. I, I, I can't get arrested with them, but people like them. Um, and if you get them on at a film festival locally or internationally, then, you know, you haven't just wasted your time. Um, the most recent, uh, most recent, has just been screening at the New Zealand Film Festival. It's called When the Cows Come Home. And um, I had a ball making this film. <laughs> just really enjoyed it. It, it. it just kind of underlined everything I like about making films. And if it's the last one I make, then uh, I'll, I'll be, you know, I won't feel like uh, I've failed. It's very hard to describe how I feel about Tilly. She's really, really smart, but I like the way she's a complete non-conformist. And in every human community, we find the same dynamic. If so, I save Tilly. <coughs> oh. Because she's full of intelligence and personality. <coughs> so she wants to play. I wanted her to be a forever cow. <laughs> I love being surrounded by cows. There's no discussion. There's no talk. It's just purely emotional. Who, who knows what sets some people off? I'm a bit complicated emotionally. I can be a tricky, difficult person with people at times. When I think about it, I've been lost for a long time but i found again
Okay, and there we have it. Um, I haven't shown all the clips that I had because I think we were going to try and have a little bit of time for a Q&A at the end. So I might just stop the share now. Stop the share. Oh. If anybody has any questions for Costa, please um, jump in, turn your video on, say kia ora, ask a question. That was so moving, Costa, just the selections that you made, even in those tiny little bits, you get this absolute intensity of emotion, even in that fragment. That's an amazing tour de force of your, your oeuvre, as they say. Thank you. My oeuvre. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> oh, that's, a, that's a fancy word, that one. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> um, I was going to ask you um, about the one Saving Grace. Mm. Sorry to go back to that one, but I just wondered why. Why did it, what, could we can see the light, the, um, the beautiful framing, all the music, the way that you do things so well. Why did that one not? Oh, I, th I think it was just story problems, um, and uh, you can you, you can put it into one word. It was ambiguous, too ambiguous, and it, it it was a very confronting, very challenging story, and it took audiences to a place of um, darkness <laughs> and despair. And that's fine; they'll go they'll go there if. Um, if you're actually supporting that journey with um, a properly dramatized um, tragedy. But what, what we had in the script, I think we were just both immature and um, um, we just didn't, didn't dramatize it properly. And basically it was a film without an ending and people hated it, really hated it. And that was incredibly painful. Um, and uh, I've, always, I've always drawn on that memory since. You know, it's it's not entirely a bad thing to have someone hate your work. <laughs> <laughs> um, Me Megan has a question. Okay. Um, I just can't turn on my video, Elspeth, but that's that's okay. That's not a bad thing. We can hear um, you. Just for your information, um, Costa, one of the move, one of your first uh, movies that I saw was about the little boy in the caravan. And he was yeah. with his dad, um, who'd lost yeah. his mother, and was a yeah, an yeah, absolute was... wreck. I, I still love that film. Um, so yeah. can you just tell us a little bit about it? Um, that was a film that I, I wrote for Zoe McIntosh. She was the director, right. and um, I mean, the, <laughs> it was very fraught because I wrote a draft that. Um, people seem to like straight away, but I formed the opinion really early on that it wasn't good enough. That it, um, it 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 just had a broken ending. It wasn't it wasn't properly dramatised. And um, unbeknownst to me, Zoe took the script to the New Zealand Film Commission and she got it funded. <laughs> and I said to Zoe, "It's actually not good enough. Like we we need to um, we need to work on this thing." And anyway, Q, two and a half years of hell and some 32 drafts. Uh, and eventually um, we got to where it should be. And I mean, what, what you want to end up with is something that's sublime, something that really works. And that's, that's not easy. You've got to really work it. And um, I, I sweated blood for that script. And, uh, but, but we knew when, 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 when it was done, I looked at it and I thought, this is good work. This is good work. Yeah. And um, and Zoe actually just went out and made it. And she never had a problem during the shooting. Like it all just came together beautifully. And that's that's something I do believe that if, if you've got something that's coherent, that is dramatically, um, that it works, then you're always going to have a, um, an easier time. Mm -hmm. Saving Grace did not work, unfortunately. Well, the, the one that did work, it was just superb. And mm. um, I remember sitting and watching it and just praying for a happy ending. Mm -hmm. You know, this this dear little man, and I just prayed for a happy ending for mm. him. So I really oh. enjoyed that. Thank you. Well, you know, we, we, we all want that, eh? That's, um, yeah. 
but but you you have to earn it you, you can't just give a happy ending to a character because they deserve it they they have well, to earn it we hoped we hoped we sat there and really hoped that this, mm. that this um beautiful young young person was going to get a happy ending yeah well he he did he did the hard work he <laughs> he came up with a plan and he executed it and um yeah. he overcame yeah difficulties and he did all the all the things that a good hero does yeah. so, um, we, it, was, it was wonderful <laughs> we have lots more questions now thank you um it's leonel and then jamana and then sarah have questions for you okay if you're okay mm -hmm. with that costa mm -hmm. yeah 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 i'm good hey, costa, thank you so much costa it's, it's very generous of you to be talking about your your career and it's wonderful to see the path that that, that, that you follow I have a couple of questions um if, do, do you think your, your Greek heritage uh, appears in in your work, or do, do you bring your Greek heritage at all? In your work. You know. And the, and the other question will be: um, it, it looks like you deal with um, with stories or, or characters that are uh, out of place. Uh, most of them are trying to find their place in, um, in whatever it is that they do or, or mm -hmm. in life. Um, could you please talk about that? Um, and you know, I have a soft spot for the last dogs of winter. I, I love that that film. That film reminds me of um, Never Cry Wolf, that wonderful, wonderful film from the from the eighties. So I, yeah. I, I I love that film. Yeah, um, that that was intentional because I love that film too. So <laughs> I was channeling, um, I was channeling that movie. Um, um, to answer your question, I, I I've not really used um, my Greek heritage directly. There's just never been an opportunity to do it. Um, I've looked at it a few times and it's just never, never quite happened. However, the experiences I had as a child, um, you know, being dislocated, being um, on the margins of things that totally uh, influence the way I see things. And so to that extent, um, then you can say that even, even though the specific cultural details might not be drawn from my life the um the, the feel is um, something like you know stalin sickle even though it's about um, a catholic child in a in a very conservative catholic milieu um i could relate to that because i was going to church and not liking it <laughs> and um so i could i could bring that experience um into, into the film yeah. Thanks. Cheers. Was that your questions, Lionel? Or we go on yep. to Jamana? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, Jamana. Um, kia ora. Kia ora, um, Costa. Thank you so much. That was just fascinating. Uh, now, for somebody who was started out on the margins of things, it seems that. Oops, my thumb is over the camera. It seems that. Oh. Uh, relationships and um, being able to get on with people is an incredibly important part of your work and um, and so it seems to I'm just kind of gobsmacked that the number of qualities and skills and characteristics you have to be to be a su successful filmmaker yeah. um, persistence as well as your creativity and your ability to to write stories and tell stories but this whole area of working with people can you just talk a bit about that because did that come easily or is that something that you've had to consciously work at um well nothing comes easy and persistence is probably my major theme like i make film after film about persistence about people who just just keep on going and they're usually creative people and they're usually miserably unsuccessful from a from a um you know a, a commercial point of view but they you know they, they they feel like they're doing something valuable and and they don't give up and um i i i suppose it's hard but maybe not because i like them i like these people i i like spending time with them i enjoy their company and um they trust me and you know we have a good time we we talk and um stuff happens and, <laughs> and then i mean what i've been working towards really for the last 20 years is just a, a really organic way of working where i'm not sort of coming in with a script and um and uh, a definite plan but i'm coming at it from the point of view of character and i'm thinking about who is this person what do they want 
um, and how they're having a hard time getting it. And then I sort of focus on those things and you end up with quite dramatic stories, even though it's a documentary. Uh, I think I think that's the secret, really. That's what that's what I mean. Why do, why do we watch films? We want we want to see other people succeeding, and we want to learn from them. And um, um, the 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 success may not be uh, fiscal, though. <laughs> it never has been for me, uh, but um, it's made me really happy. Like uh, I've I've had a, a great time going places that I wouldn't have gone otherwise, and and meeting people, and you know, having experiences and just making stuff. I love it. Yeah. Sarah. Uh, kia ora Costa. Thank you for um, that lovely presentation. I'm not saying my camera on because I've actually got my family with me and, you know, you have to kind of <clears throat> manage family expectations. So I've got two questions, one of which um, is from mine and you kind of partly answered it. So what I... Um, my question have, for you had been about do you let things happen or do you plan because your some of those shots you showed were just they seemed you know they led you in so beautifully and I wondered about how much you plan and how much you let happen uh, and then my question for um my uh, son that's with us is you know if you were a budding filmmaker what would your advice be um what, what's that quote um that Alfred Hitchcock said um uh, when when someone makes drama the director is God but when you make a documentary God is the, the director like you can't <laughs> that sounds all a little bit um a little bit religious and I didn't mean it to but um sounds like you've got a teenager in the room <laughs> yeah um basically with documentaries, my, my approach is not not to plan over much, but to research and and know a bit, you know, and and also be the thing I love most is just responding in the moment to things. And uh, so, if I see an opportunity for a shot that's got some metaphorical power, then I'll, I'll do my best to grab it and. Um, Sometimes uh, there's an element of planning, but not often. It's usually it's usually just just grabbed from circumstances because because you, you, it's very hard to control anything. Um, you know, the weather can can be awful. Uh, a subject can decide that they they're having a bad day and they don't want to talk to you, um, and so you've got to figure out a way to ask them questions that that sort of get them engaged again. Um, but what happens with me is, uh, especially if I'm interviewing someone, I hear something in what they're saying, and then I just go after it. Like I go, ah, that's that's kind of interesting. Never never thought of that. Didn't prepare for it, but uh, I just go for it. And um, you know, as, as as you go along, you you start to see opportunities for key images, and. Um, uh, you know, you can, you can put together something that has a cinematic dimension as opposed to just um, just information. I, I'm not a big fan of informational documentaries. I like I like films that are um, well, they, they they work with emotion, they work with character, and they just feel like a movie. <laughs> and um, the advice I would give to anyone wanting to make films, I, I would say, don't. You know, get a real get a real job. Um, no, that's that's a little bit glib. If if you really want to do it, then it's a hard life. It's uh, it's it's a it's a tricky um, space to be in, and not not particularly rewarding um, unless unless you're working for um, television or you know the more commercial end of things, which for me was never never an issue. I, I, I never wanted to do that. I just wanted to make films that I liked. You gave some really good advice earlier too, though, because to just practice and practice and practice. And um, it, to me, that kind of relates to Sarah's question about planning or serendipity. So I remember when you showed me those first um, early um, rushes from when the cows come home and mm. there were white flowers 
white clouds and then all the cars coming along the road were white. And I said, how did you plan that? How did you get all the cars coming along the road to be white? And you said, oh, I hadn't even noticed that, but I knew there was a reason that section of film was the one we wanted to use. So it's as though you've done all that practice and practice and practice and it's now ingrained in you and you've got those skills so well developed from all those years of work that um, it just comes naturally. So maybe that's the advice for the teenager too, Sarah. Yeah, yeah, practice. Uh, a lot of us, um, they get discouraged when um, their work doesn't um, meet the kind of standard that that they um, have in their heads. But you know, when you begin, you're gonna you're gonna have quite a gap between your expectations and your abilities, and and that that takes time and effort to to draw those things closer. And uh, nobody's good at this stuff straight away. Nobody like you have to just work away at it. And gradually you, you develop your own voice. Mm. That's great. Thank you. Appreciate both your answers. You're welcome. Tim no, it's Nicola. Kia ora, Nicola. I think you're our last question. Kia ora, thank you. Um, um hi, hi Costa. Um I, I've just been fascinated with some of the um productions that you've created and, and two of them, Last of the Dogs of Winter and When the Cows Come Home. Uh, as you were sharing those, I picked up a sense of enjoyment or fulfillment. Um, I'm just wondering if if you could sort of share with us if you have some sort of affinity or particular enjoyment of working with humans and animals, because um, certainly it, it there seemed to be um, yeah I just picked up on a connection there and I wondered if you if you could share something there with us or not. <laughs> uh, in a word, yes, yes. I like working with musicians and I like working with animals, and um, um, you know animals, or particularly dogs and. Horses are good. I didn't. I didn't ever think I'd make a film about cows, but I did. <laughs> and they were they were good fun. They they were great. And um, yeah, uh, I mean, there's 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 that thing of spectacle of just um, being out in the open. I like I like that. I like being out somewhere with lots of room. I have a horror of going into rooms and filming people talking to each other. I, I don't like doing that and quite often I find myself forced to and to me that's not it's not very interesting um, I mean you kind of have to but I'll always take uh, an active interview out in the field over someone sitting in a chair answering a series of preset questions there's there's something um, much more organic in their, in their responses that way and that's when the cows come home that's pretty much how that happened we, we, we would just go out early in the morning and you know he, he'd have various jobs to do and i just throw questions at him and he'd, he'd wax lyrical and I, i'd try and catch as much of it as i could um i wasn't going to use all of it but it's surprising all these these little insights and interesting mm. things that you know and and it's it was active that's that's the key that you're filming people being active and doing things as opposed to a sit down interview where they're just giving exposition. Mm. Thank you. Um, I think a sense of unpredictability with animals as well, poss possibly, or? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Costa. Yeah. Although, you know, if um, actually with the cows and, and with the last dogs of winter, uh, I, I'd go out there and I'd just sit with them for hours and um they're not that unpredictable they have they have little patterns they walk from here to there and then back again and they, they have these little behaviors and after a while you just start to see them and then you, you you try and capture those things so um hmm. i want to do one with horses but uh, I've, I've never quite been able to find the right subject but I'd, I'd love to make a film with horses so if you know anyone who's a, a trainer or someone with um, a big want, someone who um, who wants to uh, do something big, that might be kind of interesting. But actually, the, the next film I'm going to make is about a, a singer. She's a, a jazz singer, and she she exemplifies the theme of persistence. Um, incredibly good at what she does, and miserably unsuccessful commercially. And what, you know, why? Why? Because she's so good, but mm. it's it's very unfair and mm. just a, a subject that keeps drawing me. 
but hopefully I can I can showcase her um, how amazing she is and 